Greetings, fellow mathematicians. We're going to take a look at the integral test and address two things. First, how to apply it, and second, why you should believe it's true. So for the first part, how to apply it, let's understand first what the integral test says. And we start with an infinite series where the term is denoted as a sub n. That's the term of your infinite series. And the main theme for the integral test is we convert an infinite series into an improper integral. So the first difficult part I find students have is how do you convert the infinite series into the improper integral with this function f? So before we go any further, let's address that, how we convert from the infinite series to the improper integral. So let's say we have an example for our infinite series where the general term a sub n is 1 over n squared plus 1. Now the simple way that I like to explain this to my students in my Calc 2 course, we're just going to replace n with x. And if we do that, 1 over n squared plus 1, that'll convert to 1 over x squared plus 1. So in other words, your function of n now converts to this function of x. So we have this discrete function, a sub n takes integer values as input, and then f of x is a continuous function. All right, so the improper integral here that we would convert to is the improper integral from 1 to infinity, and then the function is 1 over x squared plus 1. All right, so that is the first thing you need to understand, how you convert from an infinite series to the improper integral. The simple way we can do that is basically just replacing n with x. Now, once you convert to the improper integral, that function of x that you found has to satisfy three conditions. In other words, the function f has to be continuous positive and decreasing on the interval. In other words, the interval for the improper integral. All right, now some of these conditions are very simple to check. Most functions you'll be dealing with, but not all, will be continuous. It'll usually be pretty easy to see if the function only gives positive values. The one that requires a little bit of work usually is verifying the decreasing condition and think back to your Calc 1 course, you can verify or show that a function is decreasing if you can show its first derivative is negative. All right, now if all three of those conditions are met, then we get the following conclusions. And basically what the integral test says is your infinite series, when you convert it to the improper integral, the convergence or divergence of the improper integral, that directly relates to the convergence or divergence of the infinite series. Whatever the improper integral does, the infinite series does the same thing. In other words, the first part, if the improper integral is convergent, then the infinite series is convergent. And similarly, if the improper integral is divergent, then the infinite series is divergent. All right, so again, how the integral test is used. First, we convert the infinite series into an improper integral. And then we try to determine if the improper integral converges or diverges. This is gonna be a nice test, at least in theory, because we can usually maybe directly evaluate that improper integral. At this point in your Calc 2 course, you have a lot of different integration methods at your disposal. So let's go ahead and write some steps so that way you can clearly apply the integral test to some problems. All right, and again, first step is we have to convert from the infinite series to an improper integral. So step one, we convert to an improper integral. 
And a very sh short explanation for how we can do that, just replace n's in the infinite series with x. So there's more to it than that, but that's a very simple explanation. All right, so that's step one. Step two, this is gonna be where most of the points are lost in a calculus two course. You actually have to verify that all three of those conditions are met. So clearly for step two, verify those conditions. So step two, verify that that function that you found or converted to, the function of x, verify that that is continuous positive and decreasing. And just as a little reminder, like I always include in my Calc 2 course, Calc 1 might have been a while ago for some of you. What we already mentioned, we're going to write it down, the decreasing condition. You can sometimes verify that by showing that the first derivative is negative on a certain interval. All right, now, once you have verified all three of those conditions, now you go to determining if the improper integral converges or diverges. So your third and final step is determine if the improper integral converges or diverges. And the two primary ways you will do that, in the third step, direct evaluation. In other words, you can maybe directly evaluate the improper integral. And a nice trick that we'll see in some following videos on specific problems, you can apply the comparison test for improper integrals. That'll be a very quick way to determine if certain improper integrals converge or diverge. All right, so that is the first part for this video, how we apply the integral test. Next, let's go ahead and get to why you should believe this is true. To see why you should believe that the integral test is true, let's take a look at a specific infinite series that'll be very easy for us to turn into an improper integral. The infinite series we'll look at has the general term one over n squared, where we're gonna sum it from n equals one to infinity. The terms of the infinite series are really simple here. When n equals one, your first term, one over one squared is one, and then each subsequent term in the infinite series is one over an integer squared. So the second term, one over two squared, one over three squared, one over four squared, so on and so on. Now this infinite series is really simple to turn into an improper integral. Just replace n with x, and we get this improper integral of one over x squared from one to infinity. Now, if you're on top of your earlier topics from Calc 2, you'll recognize this as an improper integral of the first type since there's an infinity in the integral sign. All right, and what we wanna do is make a connection with this improper integral to this infinite series. So I'm gonna draw the graph of the function, one over x squared here, and the connection of how we go from this continuous function to these values of the infinite series is we're gonna recognize the values at the positive integers well, they sit right on our graph here. This graph is a continuous graph. It contains x values where x can be any real number, but let's look at the values of x at the positive integers, one, two, three, four, so on and so on. Now, we're gonna notice here in summation notation with an infinite series, the value of n changes by one unit each time you get the next term. And if we visualize that on the graph here, 
going from n equals one to n equals two to n equals three, so on and so on. Those integers are always one unit of distance apart. So let's draw that here, the distance between each of these integers is one unit. We're talking about an improper integral. We'd like to think of improper integrals as still representing area beneath a curve. And so we're gonna to try to think here the area from one to infinity beneath that graph, but above the x-axis. So how do we make that connection? We have area involved here. We have intervals that are all length of one unit this sounds like earlier ideas in the calculus sequence doing an approximation of area with rectangles. So let's notice here the width of each of these intervals is one. Let's call that delta x. And if we make the connection to how we get the heights in this orientation, so if delta x is your width, the height, that's going to be determined by the function value. And now we can determine the area, multiply the height by the width, function value by delta x, that'll give you the area. So let's go ahead and visualize the rectangular approximations here. The first value we're going to choose for x to determine the height basically the right endpoint of that interval from zero to one. We're gonna choose that at one and we get a rectangle that looks like this. All right, now we know the width of that rectangle is one. The height, plug x equals one in there. One over one squared, we get one. So this first rectangular area is one times one. Next, we're going to go to the next interval from one to two. We'll determine the height again at the right endpoint. The width is still one of that rectangle, but the height, now when we plug in two, the height is now one over two squared. So we get one over two squared, the height times the width one. You can probably see the pattern here. The next rectangle, if we were to draw it, looks like that. The width is one, but the height is now one over three squared. And the last one that I can probably draw on my graph here at this scale, before they get to be infinitesimally small on this scale, Again, the width is one, but the height is now one over four squared. And you can see as we keep going all the way down the x-axis, x equals five, six, so on and so on. That'll be where we get basically an infinite series. And notice here, this is our infinite series up here. The first term is one. And the fact that we're multiplying by the width one, multiplying by one doesn't change anything. So this right here is our infinite series one plus one over two squared plus one over three squared plus one over four squared, so on and so on. So we have our infinite series. And what we're going to notice is our improper integral starts at one and then goes to infinity. Now, remember, area in the basic interpretation for integrals goes from the graph down to the x-axis, and our improper integral is going to start here. And what we can notice is all these rectangles all the way down the x-axis, they are beneath the graph. So this rectangular approximation will be an under approximation. So what we can say is basically the rectangular areas from one onwards are going to be less than basically the improper integral since there's more area here. You can see these rectangles don't cover those little curvy triangular regions. 
but we have to be careful. Again, the improper integral starts at one. So we're just going to add this number, that area one, and basically your rectangular approximation with this term, one over two squared, that starts with this one and then continues down the x-axis. And since, again, those rectangles are beneath the graph, we get this inequality. In other words, this infinite series is less than one, that was this area, and then the area beneath the graph from one to infinity, all those rectangles from one onwards are below the graph. All right, and that is almost everything. And what we're going to recognize, that improper integral that we get, that is a convergent P integral. That's the case where P is two. Since the power here, P is greater than one, that improper integral is convergent. But more importantly, we can actually get the value when P is two, plug that in, one over two minus one, that improper integral converges and it equals one. So what we found here is that our infinite series is less than one plus one. In other words, if we add up all those terms in our infinite series, it is less than two. So without being too much detailed about proofs and everything, what we can basically see here is if we add up all these terms, it should converge to a sum that is less than two. And in a very brief explanation, that's how we relate the improper integral to our infinite series by trying to notice it as a sum of rectangular areas. Now again, this is not a complete detailed mathematical proof, but hopefully it's enough to see since the bigger quantity here comes out to be a finite number, the smaller quantity should also be finite. In other words, this infinite series should converge and give you a finite sum. All right, I hope you enjoyed the video. Hopefully this is building your intuition throughout the calculus sequence. If you're enjoying the content, support the channel, like and subscribe.